Hello, and welcome to our Mulberry Talent Partners Leadership Conversation. We're so glad to have you here today. I'm going to give everyone just a little bit more time to log on before we get started. Okay, it seems like everyone is starting to roll in nicely. My name is Laura Back. I am the Director of Marketing and Events for Mulberry Talent Partners. If you're new to us, welcome. We're so glad to have you here today. We are a full service recruiting and temporary staffing agency in Portland, Oregon, with an office also in the Silicon Valley. We specialize in the professional placement of human resources, professional and financial office, payroll and operations positions through direct hire, temp to hire, and contract roles. Um, go on ahead and check us online out at uh, mulberrytalent.com where you can see more about our services, our upcoming career and leadership conversations, as well as links to previously reported conversations. Today, we are joined by our fabulous founder and president, Lauren Francis. Lauren founded Mulberry Talent Partners in 2017 and brings over 25 years of talent acquisition experience. And today we're pleased to welcome Rich Menedgello. He is the Senior Director of Content for Fisher Phillips, a national employment law firm. Um, and Rich brings over 24 years of employment law experience. Today, they're going to be talking about managing workplace tension during the election, which as we all know is a very timely topic. Before I hand it over, we want this to be an interactive session, so we will save some time at the end for questions. So go on ahead and use the Q&A function here on Zoom, and we'll do our best to answer any and all questions that come up. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Lauren and Rich. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, Rich. We are so happy to have you today with us, and welcome to all of our attendees. In early, uh, in early September, Rich shared a blog post uh, on how to handle unprecedented workplace tension this election season, which included a 10-step action plan. We found it to be incredibly detailed, and the post addressed several hot-button issues and recommendations to help guide employers. We invited Rich here today to chat with us on this about this timely workplace issue, and we're so pleased to welcome him. After this webinar, we will share the Fisher Phillips blog post along with the recording of today's conversation. Feel free to share it with others. So Rich, we have a lot to cover today, so let's jump right in. All right. All right. What are the signs that there is tension with a coworker in the workplace? You know, I, I really wouldn't overthink this. It, it, I think this is one of these topics where if you feel like there's tension in the workplace, there's tension in the workplace. I, I mean, it could be very obvious signs. I mean, it could be arguments that you learn about or sharp words, even physical confrontations. But really, this could come up in lots of different ways. Um, workers complaining about other coworkers about just about anything, um, you know, it, it might be as obvious as, hey, this guy's wearing a MAGA hat and I don't like it, or she's got on a a Black Lives Matter sticker, and I don't agree with that. Or it could be mundane things about people complaining about their coworker. So it would be the political tension or just the tension in the workplace that would, would manifest itself in some sort of just generic complaint. So I think it's the kind of thing where if you know there's, if you think there's tension, there's tension. Got it. Uh, how how should companies address political workplace activities such as buttons, stickers, banter, et cetera? Yeah, this is without a doubt the most common question that we get, and it and it seems to crop up every four years, and this this year more than more than ever before. Um, you know, and I, I think there's two ways to answer it. Number one, we talk about the legal standards, and then we talk about the practical. What should you do from a legal standpoint? This is a really interesting area because um, there's an area of law that most people think applies to this that really doesn't. And then there's an area of law that nobody hardly thinks about, and it does apply. And so the area of law that you really don't have to worry about is the First Amendment. Um, a good rule of thumb that I have is if somebody, especially online, says something about the First Amendment, they're wrong. <laughs> um, that's almost always the case uh, because most, unless it's something written by like a con constitutional law professor, um, anything else is probably just wrong. So um, most people think the First Amendment gives free speech rights, but really what it does is block the government, federal or state government, from restricting speech. So if you're a private employer, uh, and by that I mean you could be publicly traded. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about if you're not a state government, um, the First Amendment 
you can ignore. And the hardest part for HR or other managers is not rolling your eyes when an employee complains to you about the First Amendment. Okay? <laughs> but what does apply, and most people don't think about it, is the National Labor Relations Act. And that applies to employers whether you're unionized or not. And what it does is protect workers who are taking action or complaining about working conditions. Um, and it could be about complaining about a lack of diversity in the workplace, or they want to discuss their wages with coworkers or on social media or complaining about alleged illegal actions. If there's, if people are complaining about workplace issues on behalf of themselves or a concerted group of others, it could be protected by the National Labor Relations Act. So it's important for employers to understand that they don't necessarily have unfettered rights to control employee speech or political workplace activity like buttons and stickers or banter. But even if you do have that right, um, uh, if you've determined whether or not those actions are protected or not protected by the NLRA, um, the question becomes, do you want to do something about it in terms of, or do you want to you know, come down with an iron fist over it because of the potential it has for creating um, bad publicity? So um, a good rule of thumb, generally, if you're an employer, and, and I think this is sort of the, 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 the part I'll leave folks with on this question is, if you're gonna do it for one, you have to do it for all. You have to be content neutral. So unfortunately or fortunately, depending on your politics, it's not, you can't as an employer generally say, okay, you're allowed to have a face mask that says Black Lives Matter, but you can't wear a, uh, a MAGA face mask or something like that. Or, okay, I'll let the pro-life button, but I can't allow the pro-choice button. You generally, if you're gonna be restricting speech, can't do it in a, in a content sort of way. You have to say all or nothing. Hmm. You know, in your blog post, uh, you said the number one misconception was for, um, um, was it for employers, was this is a non-union workplace. And the number one misconception overall is I have free speech rights, which you addressed just now. And then you mentioned a mutual misconception, which is just vote or just vote the right way. What do you mean by that? Yeah, it, you know, it's it's similar to the the, um, the the potential concern that would arise if you try to legislate what people can and can't do within the workplace in terms of making decisions or having certain opinions or which opinions are right and which opinions are wrong. That's where you can run into trouble. So we generally say, if a workplace wants to encourage um, uh, voting, that's great. I mean, here in Oregon, I think today is the last day you can register to vote. If an employer wants to say, hey, everybody, today is the last day to register to vote, that's fine. But what you don't want to then take the second step is because I want you all to register to vote and then cast your ballot this way. That's that's where there's concerns could arise. Okay. Okay. How do, how do employ, employees and employers find common ground when it comes to Social justice, you may have already kind of answered this, but this is one of the questions that we um, it came up from after our conversations and so on. Social justice, the election, and the pandemic. Yeah, well, you know, if I knew the best answer to how employees and employers can find common ground these days, I might be the one getting confirmed to the Supreme Court right now. <laughs> uh, because it's it's almost an impossible uh task at this point. And, and I think that's the first thing I think I would do as an employer is take a deep breath and recognize it's really not my responsibility to ensure that our folks all reach, you know, can reach consensus on social justice issues of the election or the pandemic or face masks or whatever it is. Your job is to ensure there's a respectful and professional work environment. And it's really Hopefully this is somewhat relieving of folks. It's not your job to forge that sort of mutual understanding to workers as long as they can get along and get the work done. And, and in fact, sometimes there's a danger to intervening. But to the extent that there is a way, I think your question sort of you know, hinted at the answer and that is trying to find common ground. Try to find the areas that bind employers, bind employees, and, and doesn't separate them. Um, you, know, you could have two diametrically opposed workers who disagree about who they're going to vote for, and they might be super passionate about the candidates. Um, but perhaps reminding them, if it does come up, 
about what they have in common, you know, a desire for everyone's voice to be heard, um, for every person to vote, <clears throat> or for a community to be represented by somebody um, who, who, who follows their ideals, you know, assume, try to tell folks that assume their coworkers have good intentions and that, and that you can find common ground. But remember that you're not really trying to win the Nobel Peace Prize and, and bridge these gaps. You're just trying to lead a team so they can do good work without being at each other's throats while they're doing the work. Mm. Sounds tricky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, in all your years of practicing law, do you, is this the most unusual, I mean, this this triangle of tension is, uh, and maybe more, uh, is is quite new, unique and you're finding, uh, you know, many other challenges outside of, you know, just for the first time you're seeing, Oh yeah. you know, just unprecedented kinds of uh, workplace challenges. Uh, this is like nothing you've ever seen, I imagine. Yeah, Laura, and I think I should this is probably every person on this phone call would say the same thing. And that is, I think every day since March 11th, 2020 has been the most unusual day of my life and my working career. So yeah, I, I mean, the, the combination of it, any one of these things unto themselves would be insanely challenging. I was looking back on things we wrote four years ago in preparation for the election and, 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 and it, it all just seems so quaint, <laughs> you know, i oh, just, <laughs> Politics are fun and election season can be great around the workplace and you can even have like parties around the election and, you know, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, we were all babies four years ago. Um, yeah, the combination of the social justice, the pandemic, and just the unmitigated tension regarding this election is, is unlike anything anyone has ever seen. So if that, if that gives people at least something to think of, uh, you know, maybe maybe a little consolation, recognizing that you're not alone in this. Every other HR leader, every other business leader in the country is dealing with the same thing. Sure. You know, I wonder though, you know, as, as time has marched on, so how, how much social media also adds to uh, where, you know, this, this challenge that we're faced with. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think one of the issues about social media, and I don't think I'm saying anything that nobody else uh, uh, you know, other people recognize this is that there's an anonymity behind social media posting yeah. that leads to just more of frenetic, aggressive, abrasive communication style that you don't necessarily see in face-to-face -face contact. Mm -hmm. And what what can happen? That can bleed over to the workplace mm -hmm. in a in a couple of different ways. I mean, the obvious way is if your social media contacts with coworkers and they can see what's going on with you and and you know, I'm sure everyone out there is on social media has cousins or other family members or high school friends that you think, how can you sit? Oh my, how do you believe that? Now imagine that you're your coworker and now you have to join them on a Zoom meeting and they just posted a meme and you think it's offensive or upsetting or just, you know, tone deaf. Um, that same sort of social media style though has the danger to bleed into any other digital communications where there's not that immediate face-to-face -face interaction with somebody. So the more we're at remote work and the more you're dealing with coworkers through uh, direct messages and Slack messages and texts and emails, I, the greater the danger is there for you or for other coworkers who just say things that are, that you wouldn't say face-to-face. -face. Sure, I know. The days of sitting around the Thanksgiving table and talking about politics are over. <laughs> you know, I mean, we just didn't, we, we, we used to sort of like what you sh shared earlier, which is, you know, it used to be that we could talk, so we could be civil, civil to each other, and it's not quite the way it is right now. So it's tough. Yeah. Uh, another question: um, How should management react appropriately to an employee complaint about politics, political issues, or voting? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I think it's getting back to the, the the main point and the main thrust. I think I'd like to convey is. We focus on productivity, we focus on work, we focus on the job we're here to do. Um, and, and, that's, and that's really what we should be taking our time to do. And I would, I would remind employees if they come to you that, okay, you might have the right uh, to, an ex to, to have your opinion, but that doesn't mean you have a right to express them at work. Mm -hmm. um, you should be focused on doing your job. And, and there's, there is, a, you know, when I said the National Labor Relations Act does restrict worker uh, employers in certain ways in terms of what they can 
prevent what there's not, what they can't. There's a lot, a good laundry list of things as employers you always can put a lid on. So illegal speech, things that are against your policies, hate speech, racial slurs, harassing speech, discriminatory speech, you could always put a stop to that. Um, unprofessional, rude, profane, uh, threatening, uncivil, you can, you can stop that. Um, anything directed at customers or that discloses private customer information, obviously you can, you can put a lid on that as well. Um, and really ultimately then disruptive speech, things that even if employees do have a right to communicate about certain things, they're not allowed to do it in a way that's disruptive. Now I know there's a fine line between what is and what's not disruptive, but I at least want employers to know that if speech becomes disruptive, even if it's protected, you do have a right to, to then stop it. Hmm. Okay. You know, what would you advise management to avoid when it comes to addressing tension in the workplace? Um, the hardest part, I think, for employers is bringing your own values and your value judgments to workplace conversations. I, I think there's, we often we've sort of fallen into this trap. And I think this leads to some of the civil discourse that you just described earlier, where we're in a bubble mentality. You surround yourself with people that you that agree with you. Um, you read news from news channels that tend to follow your political persuasion. And so you think everybody must feel the same way you do. Um, right. So, you know, I'm, I'm here in Portland and it's a pretty, you know, progressive liberal enclave. Mm -hmm. And uh, a couple years ago, four years ago, in fact, uh, when there was another election going on that some might remember, right before that, I was having a conversation with people at a national um, conference I was attending and standing around. And I made the mistake of saying a couple of things that I was thinking I'm sitting around with my, my friends here in Portland. And then I realized, or looked at the name tag, I was talking with a group of three people. One was from Montana, one was from Idaho. And I could tell the way they looked at me that they thought I had three heads from what I had just said. Mm -hmm. and, and that was a really good lesson for me. And I've really tried to avoid that in the last four years. In a professional setting, um, you really have to put aside your own personal beliefs, especially when you're dealing with your employees and, and, and not make value judgments over those because that's, that's where you can run into trouble. Now, if those actions, if those beliefs, those political persuasions lead to further things, whether it's a, a, a different way or, or an uncivil way or an unprofessional way of dealing with certain people in the workplace, protected classes, um, women, uh, uh, um, racial minorities, who, whatever it is, that's when you can step in. But just because somebody is going to be voting for a certain candidate or has a certain political persuasion, um, you really, as an employer, need to set that aside when you're dealing with them. And so would you say like managers, um, let's say there's a conversation kind of getting heated with uh, a couple of coworkers, um, you know, managers interrupting those conversations. I mean, that might, might be very, very tricky. And yeah, you know, but there's some things you could do ahead of time and hopefully you have that, that can give your managers some um, resources for them to work with. And so I think it's, it's incumbent upon employers to make sure they have good policies in place and good training in place. And that will either minimize the chances of, of these conversations occurring that need to be interrupted, or at least maximize the chances of the manager having success in interrupting or putting a stop to them. So I, I would first make sure that your policies address, you know, equal opportunity employment, anti-discrimination, anti-harassment, inappropriate conduct, unprofessional conduct. They provide examples of the kinds of things that aren't allowed or should not occur in the workplace. Um, and in fact, here's a, 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 a recommendation for the employers out there. If you haven't updated those policies, unprofessional workplace action policies in the last couple of years, you probably should work with your employment attorney to do so because there have been some changes in the law, some good changes for employers that give you greater leeway when it comes to clamping down and regulating workplace conduct, especially disruptive conduct. So if you have those policies in place and then you do training with first all your workforce, but also your managers so that your managers know what is and isn't allowed 
uh, and give them the tools that they need to know this is the kind of conduct we want you to just to stop mm. and make sure that they have a role in spotting flare-ups and putting them out that at least i think will give you a leg up um, in making sure your managers know what they can do and, and when they should do it but it, it really is as simple when we're talking about practical steps as diffusing the con the, the conflict by not trying to resolve it it's that's the easy thing you know you're not you're not trying to convince one side or the other about their political beliefs you're just saying hey while you're here working or while you're remote working you should be productive you should be when you're on the clock we want you working for com for, for to do this job that's what you're here for right um, and you're not here to try to solve and referee the dispute you're just trying to say the dispute's not happening on work time sure um and then, you know, is it too late for employers to take this step? I mean, I just feel like we're, you know, employees that haven't necessarily put these, these, these practices in place. Uh, is it's not. I, too late. I have a, I have a, um, a news flash for you, Lauren. And that is <laughs> that on November fourth, there's still going to be tension in the workplace. <laughs> <laughs> okay, gotcha. So it's not too late. No, I mean, look, it, it's. It's, you know, we're, what, gosh, just three weeks from today is the election, and, and that'll hopefully fly by, maybe, I don't know, you know. Um, you know, if you wanted to have a reminder, it could be as simple as sending out your policies, in, you know, your unprofessional uh, practices policy, your professionalism policy, sending it out as a reminder. And, in, in you know, hey, folks, we know there's a lot going on. We know that this could be a tense time for you. We want you to remind you of professionalism policy. Here you go. It could be as simple as that. It could be that you call an all, all hands on deck meeting mm -hmm. where you want to go over them. It could be that you want to retrain your managers right now. Um, you can do all of those things. You could even have time to rewrite your policies before election day because, yeah, the, the, the sad truth is this is going to continue. Um, and, uh, and, and so this will, th there'll be further tension. Uh, in November and December and into the new year. So it's it, this, there's never a bad time to bring these policies uh, up to speed. Right. So in terms of the day, of the election day and the day after, I, I imagine that it's going to be very, these are going to be very distracting days for employees and employers. Uh, do you, do, I mean, I don't know if you can answer this question, but I think it's up to each individual company, but, you know, would you recommend maybe having giving an extra day off or probably more December no November 4th than 3rd I mean I don't know that's an interesting question I, I mean I, I, I've heard of a company or two who does that mm -hmm. um it's not it's not super common but it occurs because again I emotions are going to be raw potentially mm -hmm. on the 4th mm -hmm. we also you know from what you read in the news there's a good chance that we're not going to know the final election results the evening of election here and the next day. So doing that might almost be postponing the inevitable because the tension could flare up on the 5th or the 6th or the 15th or whenever. So mm -hmm. um, employers can do that if they'd like, but I don't really know if that might be sticking your head in the sand mm -hmm. um, and, and thinking you can, you know, just wish it go away. I, I honestly think that the better course is to address it head on uh, if you do sense that there's going to be tension, doing some preemptive communications about what's expected of folks in the days right before and after election day, um, that's probably a better way to go about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> here we go. Get ready. Yeah. <laughs> your seatbelts. Um, so you had, uh, you know, in your blog post, you had talked about the 10 point plan. Is there anything we haven't covered in this 10 point plan that you feel like might be notable and um, important to share? No, I, I mean, I think we've covered most of it. I mean, I, I really think that the key for employers to recognize is that, you know, much like unprofessional behavior in the workplace, it's not, there's no cure all, right? You could do every single thing. You could be the best HR person, the best leader in the world, and you still might have problems crop up. And so the, 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 you, what you're doing here by, by putting these steps in, in place is minimizing the chances of those things happening, mm -hmm. uh, but then maximizing your chance of solving it quickly and without it bursting into a bigger wildfire um, 
than as opposed to just tamping it out right away. So I think the key for employers to recognize is um, no matter what you do, don't feel um, despondent if you do see this happen. It doesn't mean as if you failed. It, it just means it you're caught. It's a numbers game and, and it's the price of doing business these days. So I think the key is recognizing these things could happen mm -hmm. and then um, uh, being proactive in terms of recognizing that you don't have a responsibility to get somebody to change their mind or to reach uh, a con a, an agreement between parties about you're right. Oh, no, I was wrong this whole time. You're right. Your goal is just to refocus it so those, those, those disagreements aren't happening during productive work time. And to neutralize. Yeah. So yeah. what can a team, HR team, a corporation expect when they uh, reach out to an employment attorney at your firm or other firms in terms, will they, it, what, what's, the, what's the process they will because I know some people on the webinar today are smaller businesses, others are larger. And what can they expect in terms of the process? They may have, they may not have a policy. They may have part of a policy. There's also all the updates that you talked about. Yeah, I, you know, look, I, I think most, most companies would expect something like this if they deal with a workplace attorney. That, number one, it does start with the policy about having something good that you can hang on to. Um, and a policy is good, and it's sort of a baseline floor of what you need, but it doesn't end there, right? So if you if you enact a policy, your your relationship with your workplace attorney that's the start, not the end. And hopefully the the start would lead them to be working with you to identify and ensure that your managers are well trained and that you are well trained to consistently handle these issues in an in an objective way, in a in a prompt way. And in a content neutral way. And so I think you, you would get some advice from a workplace attorney about, about just that consistent application of policies in a way that doesn't violate any laws. And then I think, I think most good employment attorneys uh, partner with their, um, with the companies they work for. So it's a little bit different than other workplace or other um, professional relationships or other, even other attorney relationships you have. Whereas um, you know, they, they might, there might be some limitations there. Most workplace attorneys, employment attorneys, try to partner with their um, clients so that you're not just um, giving them the law, but you're trying to help solve the workplace problem. Um, and so I think a lot of it is going to be unique. There will be questions about your workplace atmosphere, prior issues that have come up, things you're concerned about, and then they would hopefully work with you to develop a unique and personalized sort of curated plan and strategy uh, to, to help your own workplace. And do you give advice on how to deliver these messages? Because I think sometimes the, you know, the, it might be seen as, you know, you're just trying to you know, get us all, I don't know. Sometimes there's just some sort of negative uh, effect to, you know, maybe presenting it at this time, but I don't know if you have any advice around that in terms of the presentation and communication and. Yeah, you know, and there's various ways you can do it. I mean, there are, there are workplace consultants who can come in and sort of help you deliver a training to your workforce, more of an interactive training about minimizing tension. If, the, you know, this is a long running issue and you know it's there and it's been there and it's gonna continue, you know, maybe this is bigger than just election season. If that's the case, um, you know, one recommendation I have at the end of the blog post, you're going to circulate, um, there's a, a link to a training, an interactive training that one of our firm's subsidiaries does. They're an HR consulting company um, that does a managing 2020 workplace tensions interactive training. Mm -hmm. Something like that could be interesting for somebody, um, but it also could be put on in-house. If you have the skill and the talent in-house, um, these are also things that, that you can do as well. It's just sometimes I know people like outside consultants come in and deliver, but um, you know, that, that sounds like the best approach. Right. I, lo I looked at that, uh, their website last night. Uh, they're in Kentucky. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Yep. Very good. Yeah. No, there's a lot of great stuff there. Foundations, human resource consulting. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. Well, Laura's back with us. Hi. We did have one question that came in. Um, from Terry, she has the experience of working with CEOs who tend to try to push out their own political agenda. 
Um, and she was wondering how you would approach that coaching conversation. So this is now you're coaching upward. You're, you're the HR oh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, that's difficult. <laughs> Sorry, Terry. Yeah, you probably haven't. This isn't the first time I'm sure you've had to deal with this. Um, you know, I, I, I think ultimately folks generally learn best when they understand the potential repercussions. And so what I would do is engage the CEO or, or your upper level manager in what, um, what's their ma biggest pain point? Are they somebody that's very bottom line driven? If they are, talk to them about how you could point out statistics about how tensions in the workplace that can lead from these kinds of things can hurt uh, retention and turnover, which can hit your bottom, hurt your bottom line, or could lead to lawsuits, which hurt your bottom line. If they care more about um, sort of the, the soft costs of a workplace, then talk about how this sort of, you know, um, content messages can lead to lower productivity because it'll lead to people arguing about stuff, which should then lead to less work getting done. So I think I'd aim for, you know, what is it that's going to change their mind? And there are lots of messages to deliver if you go around that way. Mm, very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Well, that wraps up all the time that we have today. So just quickly, I wanted to highlight our upcoming career conversations and leadership conversations. Uh, next week, we are going to be joined by Jill Freeman. She is an employee engagement consultant. Um, she's going to be talking to us about how to design engaging employee communication. And in that, we're going to be raffling off two 90-minute sessions with Jill. So be sure to register for that. And then in November, we're going to welcome Alex Kerr, who's going to be sharing some insights into learning and development. And then just in closing, here is how to stay in touch with us. So we would recommend that you connect to Rich and Lauren on LinkedIn, visit our websites. Um, and also just wanted to thank you for joining us today. We know you have a lot of options in terms of webinars, and we really appreciate and value your time. And thank you, Lauren and Rich. Well, thanks so much. It was a great conversation, Rich. Thanks so much. Yeah, it was, a, it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. All right. Bye, everyone. Have a good day. Good luck. <laughs>